Good evening, everyone. My name is Jesper Freins, and I'm the team manager of Forza Hydrogen Electric Racing. Welcome very much to our third live stream in which we uh, show you parts of our design. Um, we can talk to our engineers and you can ask your questions. You can do so here in the live chat and we will try to answer them for you. If you haven't seen our first and second live stream yet, you can do so here at our YouTube channel as well. So for people that are new, uh, first, let me explain a bit about uh, Forza itself. So Forza is a team that uh, develops, builds, and races hydrogen electric race cars. It's a team that consists of students, and we do this to promote uh, the power and the potential of hydrogen, as we believe it will uh, play an important role in uh, a sustainable and clean future. So um, these cars, uh, we started 13 years ago with a uh, go-kart, and now after eight, eight uh, iterations, we ended up at this car, the Forza 8. Um, and last summer, this car, the Forza 8, became the first hydrogen electric race car, not just to finish an official race, uh, but also to beat its competitors, just regular uh, petrol cars. Uh, in, so by that, this car uh, and the team became the first to uh, win against other cars with a hydrogen race car. Um, now, the team itself, as you can see, consists of students. Uh, and they stop uh, their studies, they halt their studies for 13 months to work on this project. Uh, we don't get any student credits for this. We don't get any financial support. We just do it out of pure motivation and will. And that creates a very nice environment to work in. Um, but anyway, thank you for joining in, uh, in our third live streams. As I said, in these live streams, we give you more insight on the design. and. Uh, yeah, again, you can ask your questions uh, that you would like to ask me or the engineers in the live chat. Last month, we talked about um, more hydrogen. So we talked with Martin Osowski about racing strategies and to Tür Knevels about our hydrogen tanks and also packaging all the components nicely in the car. Um, so Again, if you haven't seen it, you can do so here at our YouTube channel as well. Normally, I would continue to the uh, to today, but before I do that, uh, I would like to uh, tell you some great news. Um, we would have had another live stream next month, but we don't want to let you wait any longer, and we want to already share the design of the Forza Nine with you for next month. Instead of the regular live stream, we will host a design presentation um, and you will get to see the full design of the Forza 9. You can do it exactly the same like we do now. Uh, so here at the YouTube channel, we will get a link, uh, same time, same place, eight o'clock in the evening, Amsterdam time. And well, yeah, we will reveal what the Forza 9 uh, will be. So I'm very excited. I hope you are as well. So now let's move to tonight. Um, today, the episode is more cooling. As the next car produces more than twice the amount of power, we also need to cool more, right? Um, but what does it also mean for aerodynamics? To answer that question for you, we would like to show you the reveal video that we posted last Friday. Okay, um, I hear we have a bit of technical issues, issue, uh, so the, the video uh, doesn't work. So we'll just continue. Um, but at least we need more cooling um, because we also have twice the amount of power. Um, and for that, we need a lot of air. That's basically a short summary of what the, the video said. Um, but we are here to explain that right now. So this Thank you. 
right, so in the end, we did manage to um, fix the video. So that's that's nice that you could see it. Um, so we need a lot more cooling. Um, to explain how that has been done, tonight we are joined by Lars Stalsma. And Lars is one of our fuel cell engineers. We already spoke with Munir and Pranav in the first episode. Uh, but Lars is specialized in cooling. So that's why he's here tonight. Um, so, well, Lars, uh, welcome and uh, please introduce yourself. Hi, Jesper. Thanks for having me. My name is Lars and I'm one of the fuel cell engineers and I'm in charge of the thermal systems in the car. Here I'm able to apply my knowledge obtained in heat transfer during my bachelor's in applied physics. All right, Lars, welcome. Um, so in a review video, we saw that we need a lot more cooling. I said it a few times as well. Um, because we have twice the power with the Forza 9 with respect to the Forza 8. So maybe as an introduction, start with uh, why we want to cool uh, our car and how it works. Yeah, sure, Jesper. We can separate cooling into three parts. First, we have a component that generates heat. If you don't cool the component, its temperature will rise, and when the temperature gets too high, the component, get, uh, the component will break. Using a cooling liquid, we move the heat from the source and transport it to a place where we can reject the heat. In the third part, we uh, arrive with the hot coolant at this place, and the heat is rejected to the ambient air using a radiator. This is quite similar to the heating system in your home, where the boiler generates heat, which is then transported to your house using water and rejected to the air, such as it's nice and warm in your house during the winter. The difference between the two applications is that in our car, we want to remove heat from our component, and in your house, you want to heat up the air in your house. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that's a nice metaphor. Um, so basically to summarize it, um, we want to transport the heat away from the component to a place where we can cool it, if I get it correct. Yeah, that's right, Jesper. Okay. Um, and in the reveal video, we also saw that the fuel cell generates quite a bit of heat. Um, can you more can you tell us more about this heat that fuel cell uh, produces and its efficiency? Because that's also what we saw in the reveal video. Yeah, definitely. So let's first start off with an example comparable to the problem we have in our car. When you're cycling quickly, you're converting energy stored in your body partially to mechanical energy, which moves your bike forward. But a significant part of the energy is also converted into thermal energy. That's why you feel hot and start sweating. Something similar happens in our car. As explained in the first live stream, we convert hydrogen and oxygen to water. And in this reaction, energy is released. Part of this energy is electrical energy, which uh, powers the light bulb in the diagram. In our car, we use, to power it, uh, we use it to power our electric motors and race over the circuit. A substantial part of the energy, however, is released as thermal energy, or heat, as can be seen in the diagram as well. For this reason, we define our efficiency as the ratio of useful electrical energy produced to the total uh, energy produced. At our maximum set point, our efficiency is around 50%. This means that if we're generating 200 kilowatts of power with our fuel cell stack, we also need 200 kilowatts of cooling. All our components in our car, such as the electric motors and the DC-DC converter, are also non-perfect, meaning that those components also need a cooling system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so because the components that we have in the car uh, because they are not 100% uh, efficient, they produce heat. And uh, yeah, basically that's why we need to cool them down. Otherwise it would break. Uh, you talked about this uh, cooling system. Uh, you would, yeah, well, you explained a bit already, but could you maybe go a bit more uh, inside, like in depth on the cooling system itself? Yeah, I'll elaborate for a minute. So a cooling system is the complete system that entails generation, transportation, and rejection of heat. It contains five basic elements. Of course, we have the component which generates heat and needs to be cooled. Referring back to the heating system in your house, this is your boiler, and in our car, it could, for example, be the fuel cell. Then we need a coolant to facilitate the transportation of the heat in the cooling cycle. We use a system where the outside air is used to cool down a liquid 
which in turn cools down the hot components in the car. We do this because for a lot of components in the car, it is not possible to cool it down with air directly. In the heating system in your house, water is the coolant. But for our hydrogen fuel cell application, we need a special coolant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe this is a nice uh, time to um, move to where we actually get our coolant from. Um, and we get that from our partner, VASF Glissantin, uh, and they make a special coolant uh, optimized for using fuel cell systems. Um, and to explain this uh, tonight, uh, for this, we are joined by Dr. Masayuki Hirosue, uh, and he's from product development automotive fluids at VASF Glissantin, and uh, yeah, we'll say enjoy. Thank you very much for your time. And today, we are very glad to introduce you about Glissantin. Glissantin is a coolant brand from BSF. Our coolant, FCG20, has three big advantages. First advantage is a corrosion protection. Second pro protection is a overheating. And third advantage is a low conductivity. This low conductivity performance ensures to the car have a safety performance and due to this low conductivity this coolant has a good synergy with fuel cell thermal management system this is for sure that fcg20 will maximize the performance with fuel cell cars thank you very much thank you muscle -san. so we use glycetin fuel cell g20s for its low conductivity as this prevents current leakages from the fuel cell to other components, which would be very dangerous. So now the safety is ensured by this special fuel cell coolant. The coolant, of course, needs tubes to flow through uh, the system to get to a different location, similar to the heating pipes going through your house. And if the coolant is not going to move itself, we need a pump to move the coolant through the cycle. As we will need a lot of cooling, we also need a lot of coolant flow. This flow is ensured by using pumps manufactured by our partner, Peerberg. We have pumps in our system that move three liters of coolant per second. If we move, would move all the coolant in our whole car, in one tube, we would move even eight liters of liquid per second. This is equivalent to pumping five bottles of Coke per second through your cycle or opening 40 water faucets in your home. In the last step, the heat is rejected from the coolant to the ambient air. Through a radiator called a, uh, through a component called a radiator, just as happens in your house. So, um, yeah, again, we transport the heat away from the component to a place where we can cool it. And you, you say you call it a radiator, and that's like the ones that you have in your house. We know what those look like, but I don't assume these radiators uh, in in yeah in our car work the same as in our house or or are look like the ones that we have in our in our own home could you maybe sh yeah, explain them how they work and, and how they look like yeah definitely so th they're both radiators but they look quite a bit different so radiators are heat exchangers used to transfer thermal energy in our case we're uh, moving thermal energy from the hot coolant to the cold air this heat exchanger consists of small tubes to which the coolant flows Around these tube, tubes, the ambient air flows in perpendicular direction. In the diagram, you can see the hot coolant moving in the red arrows, and 90 uh, or perpendicular to it is the air in, with the blue arrows. Due to the difference in temperature, uh, energy will flow from the hot coolant to the cold air. To increase heat rejection from the coolant to the air, fins are added between the tubes. That's the zigzag lines between the tubes. So there's more contact area for the air to transport energy through. The coolant inside the system is contained and keeps recirculating through the system. Therefore, we often speak of a cooling cycle. Cold air is supplied by driving quickly, but how that exactly works can be better explained by our aerodynamic department. All right. Uh, well, Lars, thank you very much for, uh, for joining in and answering all my questions. Um, yeah, thank you very much for being here. You're welcome, Jesper. Thanks for having Hi. me. Goodbye. Um, so, um, tonight, 
Lars already said it. Uh, we are joined, of course, by uh, the aerodynamics department. Uh, so we are joined by uh, Martijn Jorse and Thijs Goetzee. And they are our aerodynamics engineers. And they design the bodywork of a car, but maybe you guys can explain it better. So Thijs and Martijn, welcome. And uh, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Jesper. So my name is Martijn. And as an aerodynamics engineer at Forza, I'm responsible for both running and monitoring the uh, computer simulations we do for the flow, both inside and outside of our car. My name is Thijs Goetze, um, also an aerodynamics engineer at Forza, and I'm responsible for improving the aerodynamic efficiency of the car and ensuring that we have sufficient cooling mass flow to uh, run through our radiators. All right, welcome guys. Um, I just spoke to Lars and uh, we ended with that, um, uh, he gives you a number basically or a requirement for the, the air uh, that has to go through the, the car to cool all the, yeah, the coolants in the radiators and the system. Um, so basically then you get his number or his requirement. What's next? Where do you start? Well, at the beginning of our design process, we started from the design of the Forza 8. So the car that's currently driving around. And based on the results of that car, as well as the requirement Lars was giving us, we figured we need about two times the mass flow through our radiators compared to the Forza 8. So to put it into perspective, this is 3.5 kilograms through our radiators every second during normal racing conditions. Over the entire race, this is the, this is the same as 70,000 bathtubs or four Olympic swimming pools worth of air. So this is quite a large requirement that we have to not meet. And in order to do this, we decided to change the entire cooling concept step by step from the Forza 8 to what it is now in the Forza 9. Um, to do this, we started at the front uh, at our inlet where we wanted to increase the amount of clean air we're able to capture and send towards our radiators. Uh, perhaps I should explain what we mean by clean air. Uh, by clean air, we mean something that uh, air that's not too heavily disturbed by any component or parts in front of it. So similar to how in Formula One, uh, the car driving behind another car will have less downforce due to the air being disturbed and dirty air coming off of the car in front of it. Uh, all components in front of our wheels will disturb the air going towards our radiators, meaning we can get less performance or cooling out of it. So this was the first major challenge we tried to uh, overcome in our cooling design change. Uh, after that, the air would go through the radiators and the second big challenge came up and that was where the air would go after the radiators. Mm -hmm. uh, this was really difficult as the compartment behind the radiators where all the air has to go through or out somehow uh, is quite closely packaged with already critical components as we showed in our last live stream. So we had to figure out a way for the air to go out somewhere, but we'll get back to that in a second. Mm -hmm. um, something I think would be nice to mention here is that we could have shorten this design process a whole lot by just adding an enormous scoop onto the car. But uh, as you can imagine, a scoop like this would not really be a very good thing for air resistance. It would increase it a lot and make it very hard to drive fast around the track, which of course is a very important part of the aerodynamics of a racing car as well. So this is a nice indication to show the constant trade-off we are in as an aerodynamic department between getting enough cooling and also maintaining a good aerodynamic design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this uh, constant trade-off between aerodynamics and cooling, we will get to later, because I first want to go to the, to the three points you mentioned earlier. So the first one, which was uh, uh, that you said, we first wanted to get uh, enough air into the car, enough clean air. Um, so how did you manage to get enough air to the car, to the radiators? Well, obviously, the first thing that the air encounters is the inlet itself. So uh, we basically made two big changes on the front. Uh, the first would be our main inlet. Now, our main inlet sits uh, at the side of the car. And as you can see in the animation, uh, the air enters into that inlet towards our radiator. Um, now, one of the things we changed um, of this inlet compared to the previous inlet is the shape. So uh, in this current picture, you can see on the left uh, with the red circle around it, you can see the Force 8. And on the right, you can see the Forza 9. As you can see, the inlet shape has um, changed and also the inlet size has increased. Now this increased inlet size allowed us to just grab more air and obviously more air means more mass flow. Um, so that's one of the first things that we improve. 
Second thing was we added another inlet. So not only do we have an inlet at the side of the car, we also have inlets at the bottom of the car. Now this inlet sits a bit farther forward. And because of that, um, the air is very clean as Martijn explained. So we like to grab air far, far in front. So that means uh, it's, it's high quality basically. Uh, and these two changes uh, are basically what, um, at least in the front, helped us gain our, uh, and improve our cooling performance. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, you focused on getting good, clean air uh, into the car to get the most out of the air that hits the car, basically. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, okay, that was step one. We have that air enters the car and it goes to the radiators. But you talk, also talked about step two, which is actually making sure that it, it goes through the radiators. Um, why did you say that? Is it not easy for it to go through the radiators? No, actually, to get the amount of mass flow we need through a radiator, you actually have to force it quite a lot. Uh, we do this by increasing the pressure right in front of the radiator by both changing and uh, iterating on the shape of the duct, leading the air towards the radiator, and just by the resistance the radiator has. So we create a lot of pressure right in front of the radiator to push all the air through that we need. But then, of course, there's also a lot of force on the radiator, which is essentially air resistance. In fact, about one third of the total air resistance of the car is made up by the radiators. So one third of our total drag is only reserved for cooling, which once again brings us back to the trade-off we are constantly having between getting enough cooling and also satisfactory aerodynamics. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so now let's close the loop. I mean, we have the air going into the car, we have the air going through the radiators, but I, I assume that air also has to go out somewhere. So where does it go out and, and how does it work? Well, in the current Force 8, as the car is now, uh, the air just exit out the compartment in the back um, as it does in all other LMP cars. However, because of our uh, increased uh, cooling performance requirement, uh, all of a sudden um, that turned out to be very hard, not only because of the increased cooling performance, but also as Matijn just said, there are a lot of components back there. To show you in our last live stream, you, you probably saw that uh, it's, it's really full there and we noticed um, from our aerodynamic simulations that that was blocking the air in the back. Um, now, this is probably the reason um, or the area that we improved most this year. Um, by recognizing that problem, um, we saw ways to uh, fix it. And one of the things we came up with was um, instead of air just exiting out the back, um, we devised a outlet, actually a double outlet towards the side. Now, uh, our simulation showed that this yeah, increased the cooling performance by uh, quite a lot. And it's, um, it helps the air not being blocked there, but being al allowed to escape freely and ensuring more mass flow through our radiator. Mm -hmm. So basically, you you, do, you don't get a traffic jam of air in front of the radiator, so to say. Yeah, exactly. It can go away. Okay, so uh, then cooling is safe. Um, but Martijn, you also mentioned the, the trade-off between aerodynamics and, and cooling performance uh, a few times already. Um, and we have a lot more to cool. Uh, but did you, did you manage to keep the performance then? Well, yeah, actually, in... In fact, despite the extra drag and the extra cooling problems that we had, we we're actually able to improve the aerodynamic performance of the fours and nine compared to the fours eight as well. Uh, especially in the front, we're able to generate a lot more downforce compared to the fours eight. Uh, so much so that at our top speed, we have about a ton of downforce. Uh, this is the equivalent of putting one and a half Formula One car on top of our car in terms of force. Um, but of course, there's also uh, not just the raw downforce, but also how effectively are we able to create it. And uh, despite the extra air resistance, we're able to improve the aerodynamic efficiency by 15% roundabout as well. Um, perhaps I should quickly explain aerodynamic efficiency, how we define it. And for us, it's an indication of how effectively we're able to pr produce the downforce that we uh, get. And this is done by comparing how hard we can get the air to push the car down compared to how much resistance we get as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, you, you say that you, you improved the aerodynamic efficiency by 15% or a bit more, uh, and that you get a ton of downforce at, at top speed. 
but how do you get these numbers? How do you how do you quantify this? Well, yes, but for that we use something called CFD. And uh, CFD stands for computational fluid dynamics. And what it basically does is the computer calculates the airflow around the car for us. You could basically see it as a, a digital wind tunnel in which we can place our car. Now, um, once we place that car in the wind tunnel, we are able to see the forces on each different component. And from there, we can iterate. We can look at the air going around the car, um, see where it may be misaligned or something other. And from there, we can design improvements. Um, now, this is a very computationally intensive task. Um, actually, we have a dedicated cluster of 12 computers running for us nonstop. Uh, and with that, we can run two simulations uh, at a time. Uh, however, each simulation takes a total of 20 hours to finish. Um, so you can imagine that there's a lot, a lot of uh, calculating going on there. Uh, up to date, we've done a total of 285 runs. Uh, which means we've done 285 iterations on the car, and uh, and that has led to well the way the car looks at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, well very clear. Um, so now almost a year ago, uh, you started on the aerodynamics design of the Forza 9. Um, if you look back now, does the Forza 8 look like the Forza 9, or does the Forza 9 look like the 8, or are they similar? Are they different? I think that, well, after all the changes we've made, I think the changes in bodywork will make the cars look quite different. Despite following similar regulations, I think they'll really have a different look. Um, and well, we already showed you the changes we made in the inlets and the cooling design, which will mostly be hidden underneath the bodywork. But I think the bodywork on the outside also has changed so much that you'll definitely see a big difference in the Forza 9 compared to the Forza 8. But those changes will be revealed in our final design presentation next month. Yeah, indeed. Um, so we also have a question from the audience from Joke Cordes. Um, the question is, do weather conditions affect the working of the system? So I assume it's about uh, yeah, the cooling and, and the, the heat in the system or just the performance itself. Um, could you maybe explain it a bit? Because you also simulate at a certain uh, air temperature, right? Yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, well, definitely weather conditions do affect, uh, well, the behavior of the car, uh, especially the temperature is for the cooling is really important because how big are the temp, uh, how big the temperature difference between your coolant and the air we're sending through a radiator is, how larger the amount of heat is we can get to dump to the air. So we can cool a lot more if it's a lot colder outside. So mm -hmm. that that's one big, very big thing. And then we run our simulations at one condition, which is like kind of average conditions at sea level, which in the Netherlands is fair enough. Uh, of course, they will vary slightly, but unless there's very extreme weather, the aerodynamics of the car won't really change that drastically. Okay, okay. And also next to that, of course, uh, uh, the vehicle dynamics engineers would say the, the tire degradation also uh, is heavily influenced by the track temperature. Um, but yeah, indeed, it does influence your uh, your performance. But you actually have a a safety factor on top of that, right? So basically, yes. on the you, you simulate at, at really extreme and difficult conditions, uh, at least for the cooling, so that we also in those conditions can race, right? On, on yeah, we we assume that uh, as a race uh, is in the summer, uh, and we're race, racing on the track, and there's a lot of other cars on track which are also all throwing out uh, hot air. Um, so we assume a very high temperature, um, and from that we run our simulations to check if we can still operate our highest performance at that high temperature. Okay, well, nice. Um, so, um, these were all the questions that we had time to answer, uh, or time for to answer. Um, well, Thijs and Martijn, thank you very much for joining in and answering the questions. Uh, it was nice to have you here. So thank you. Thank you for having us. All right, goodbye. So um, again, we discussed many things in this live stream uh, from uh, cooling performance to aerodynamic design. Um, we hope you thought it was another very interesting live stream. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Thijs, Martijn, Lars, and also uh, BASF Glissantin for their nice contribution uh, to the live stream. But before you go, 
Um, don't forget, next month we have the design presentation. You can follow it. Uh, there will be a, a link to our YouTube channel again. Um, it's on August 12th, 8 o'clock in the evening, Amsterdam time. Uh, at that moment, you can get to see the full Forza 9, the next hydrogen electric race car. Thank you very much.